This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in his course on the book of Revelation. This is the final session, session number 30, Revelation chapter 22, New Jerusalem, and how to read the book of Revelation. So who are the nations in 21, 24, and 20, uh, 26, and where do they come from? Uh, some have interpreted this as a reference to the nations who are redeemed throughout all of history, and now they are in the New Jerusalem, and that, that's uh, certainly possible. Uh, we saw back in chapter 5 and even chapter 1 that uh, Christ has redeemed people from every tribe, language, tongue, and nations, and some would suggest that's what we see here. Uh, however, when, uh, when you read the text of Revelation, it appears that these, uh, the, the, the reference to the nations and the kings in this section, uh, especially the kings of the earth, uh, John calls them the kings of the earth, and now the nations, seem to be those who have colluded with the beast, seem to be those who have uh, sided with the beast and his rule, and now, now they enter the New Jerusalem. In other words, what I think is going on here is, is this. John is, although we've seen that they've already been destroyed and judged in chapter 15, uh, 19 and 20, now they enter the New Jerusalem. What I think is going on is, is John is uh, uh, juxtaposing two images, one of final salvation and one of final judgment, to demonstrate the complete nature of God's judgment, but also the complete nature of his salvation. Uh, John is not interested in quantifying the categories, as if to say what's well, the survivors of those who are judged in, in, in uh, 19 and 20 that make it. He doesn't tell us that, uh, nor does he, uh, obviously I don't think John thinks that every single last person of the nations uh, enters the New Jerusalem, but John talks, uh, John speaks in rather absolute terms. On the one hand, all the kings of the earth, all the nations are judged in 19 and 20. Now we have the kings of the earth and the nations entering the new Jerusalem. What's going on? We, like other images in Revelation, we shouldn't, I don't think, take this too literally. Uh, but instead, this is a way of John demonstrating the complete judgment of the nations, but also the complete salvation of the nations to be included in the New Jerusalem. And we've seen the reason for this is part of what John must demonstrate, and he's hinted at already, is the kingdom of this world must become the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Part of that means also that the nations, those who are under the rule of the beast, must now be transferred to the rule of, the, of God and Jesus Christ. And at a literal level, that does not mean every single last person in the nations or everyone who followed the beast, etc., etc., now automatically becomes a, a part of the New Jerusalem. But once more, John, it, it would defeat John's purpose to try to quantify and say, is, you know, 60% of the nations or half of them go to judgment and half to salvation, because John wants to demonstrate the complete arrival of God's kingdom, the complete defeat of Satan and his kingdom, and the complete arrival of God's kingdom means that those who are under the rule of the beast have the transfer of the kingdom means that those under the rule of the beast now come under the rule of God himself. They now belong to God. So the, the, uh, the absolute judgment and absolute salvation scene is, is simply meant to contrast just that the absolute comprehensive nature of God's judgment, but also the absolute and comprehensive nature of the salvation that he brings. And it's possible that we are to understand this at a literal level as those who are not judged and who survive judgment and are converted are the ones who enter the New Jerusalem. But John's language is very different from that. Uh, he does not quantify it. He simply wants to show 
the, the stark nature of both judgment and salvation, the complete, the complete arrival of and the comprehensive nature of his kingdom in the new creation means the transfer of, of uh, those under the rule of Satan now to enter the rule of God in Jesus Christ into the new Jerusalem. It's also possible this has sort of a hortatory function, that is, it presents the options that are available to the nations, either salvation or judgment, but uh, primarily I think the contrast is mainly rhetorical, uh, not mathematical, as if we're to uh, uh, take these two strictly and literally, but uh, rhetorically contrasting uh, the end time, uh, the, the final and comprehensive, absolute nature of the end time judgment that God brings that completely replaces and overturns the judgment of God on Satan and his kingdom. And now transferring the kingdom to himself, transferring the subjects of Satan's rule to his rule is I think what is implied here. Uh, at the same time also, I think we should think of this as Part of the end time salvation anticipated by Isaiah means the inclusion of the nations. So that, uh, I, I wonder if we should understand this again, not so much as this is a vision of those who have been redeemed throughout history, now entering the New Jerusalem. I think given the end time context of chapter 21 and 22, and given the, 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 the meaning and function of Isaiah 60 and Isaiah 2, is we should see these nations as nations who are converted at the coming of Christ that enter the New Jerusalem in fulfillment of Isaiah 60. Yes, nations are converted uh, uh, throughout church history and become the people of God, but now I think, consistent with Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 60, we see an end time gathering of the nations to become the people of God. John doesn't tell us exactly when, during the second coming of Christ that takes place. He doesn't say how it takes place, but uh, clearly in fulfillment of Isaiah 2 and 60, I think John sees a, 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 an ingathering and an inclusion of uh, the nations to become the people of God. Verse 27 then is important because it reminds us, although the New Jerusalem is an inclusive city, it still has limits. In verse 20 says, although all the nations come into it, although they bring their, their wealth, they contribute to the city, and uh, maybe this is an example of a text that suggests that there's going to actually be activity and meaningful work and activity in the New Jerusalem. Uh, uh, verse 27 reminds us that at the same time, nothing impure will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So Revelation is an inclusive city, or the New Jerusalem of Revelation is an inclusive city. It, it, it includes the Gentiles, but at the same time there are limits. Nothing impure, and no one impure will enter it. Uh, 27 then suggesting to me that he doesn't think every single last person of the nations is going to enter the New Jerusalem, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, only those who respond in, in uh, uh, faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So we end with a temple city that is so infused with God's glory and God's presence that it is a temple, as a temple that is so infused with God's presence, the nations now come to its light, the nations are now included without violating the purity and the holiness of the city, and uh, uh, now we are prepared for the last segment, uh, chapter 22 and 1 through 5 where, uh, let me read, this is the, the last part of John's vision of the New Jerusalem temple. And he says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, 
bearing twelve crops of fruits, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the uh, Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And so ends John's uh, final vision of uh, Revelation 21 and 22. Verse 6 will kind of start to bring us back to earth in a sense, uh, back to the present. But uh, uh, at this point, John ends his vision of the, the final inheritance, the final climac uh, climactic uh, uh, event that brings God's redemptive history to its close. Uh, now, uh, uh, just a number of features to, to uh, mention of chapter 22, 1 through 5. 22, 1 through 5 is not an additional thing that John sees. Uh, that is, it, this is not an additional place, uh, something that is uh, to be understood as separate from the New Jerusalem uh, temple so far. Uh, 22, 1 through 5 is a different way or further description of the New Jerusalem, New Creation temple from uh, chapter 21. And uh, 22, 22, 1 and 2 are the, is the section that clearly alludes back to or clearly draws our attention back to paradise or back to the Garden of Eden. And in this section then, uh, both garden and temple imagery dominate uh, 22, 1 through 5. And uh, every verse in this section, I think, uh, relates either to the Garden of Eden or to the temple. And, and I don't think we should separate the two as, as hopefully we'll see. The primary text that John is drawing on, although uh, there are a number of apocalyptic texts that talk about the garden and uh, include the garden in eschatological salvation, John, uh, and John is probably aware of those and maybe drawing on those as well, but John is primarily dependent on Ezekiel chapter 47. Uh, the first 46 verses describing the temple, the end time uh, restored temple, that uh, John has been drawing on, and now he also draws on chapter 47. So 47 begins, The man brought me, the angelic being probably taking him on a visionary tour, brought me back to the entrance of the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. Which, uh, interestingly, is the direction in which Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, and the cherubim guarded the entrance, the east entrance, uh, drawing the connection between the garden and the temple. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate, facing east, and the water was flowing from the south side. And as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through the water uh, that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to my waist. And then he measured off another thousand and it was so deep he, he then couldn't cross uh, because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. So he asked me, son of man, Ezekiel, uh, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into Arabah, where it enters the sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. It swarms with living creatures. Uh, uh, or swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh so that where the river flows, everything will live. And I'll stop right there for now. But I want you to note the connections with uh, uh, Revelation 22, the mention of the river of water of life. Ezekiel does not call it the water of life. John does. Uh, back in chapter 21, uh, part of the promise to those that's offered to God's people is, uh, 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And so now John uses that same imagery here. The water that flows out is the river that flows out from Ezekiel 47. Now John calls the water of life. But this is not inconsistent with Ezekiel because Ezekiel makes clear the water that flows out gives life to all the creatures. And it gives life to every, everywhere it flows. Uh, so John's description is completely consistent with that. Uh, the other big difference is, in Ezekiel's vision, the river flows from the temple. But we've already seen that John's, in John's vision, there is no separate temple. The Lamb and God are the temple. Uh, their, their presence so, fill, so infuses the, temp, the new creation, uh, the new Jerusalem, that it doesn't need a temple. So John takes the temple imagery and applies it to the entire city. Now, what John does, since there's no physical temple, the water can't come from the threshold of the temple. Instead, now it comes from the throne, uh, from the throne of God and the Lamb. Why? Because God and the Lamb are the temple back in chapter 21 and verse 22. I saw no temple because God and the Lamb are its temple. So now the water flows from their throne as the fulfillment of Ezekiel's temple. Uh, John may also have in mind Zechariah chapter 14 verse 8 as part of his background as well for the, the uh, water flowing out. But uh, the other thing I want to note that is different from Ezekiel's vision is in Ezekiel 47, John saw trees, apparently plural, or I'm sorry, Ezekiel, Ezekiel saw trees growing on each side of the river. Now note what John sees. He says, down the middle of the great street, or it could even, it'd be a little, again, not that we should push the symbolism. It would be a little strange to have a river running down the middle of the street, unless the street is very, very wide. But the other way to understand this is the plaza, or the broad open space in the city. The river could be flowing down through that. But once more, I, I don't know that we're to try to push the imagery too hard and make such literal geographical or architectural sense out of it. But the river flows down the middle of the city, and then John, like Ezekiel, John says, on each side of the river stood the tree of life. Singular, apparently. Now, some have taken this as what they call a collective, a collective image, that tree stands for many trees. So, the, so we should understand tree here as many trees, that is the same trees that Ezekiel saw in his vision. Some, some have concocted rather strange explanations. Actually, uh, and to, to provide a little background, if uh, here in Colorado, uh, where I live, one of the, the most popular and common trees you see is the aspen tree. And what is noted about the aspen trees, you often find them in groves because their root system is actually interconnected underground. You'll have an aspen tree grow and its roots underground will then produce others. Some have suggested something similar here, that the tree actually grows on one side, but its, its roots then uh, cause it to grow on the other side as well, under the water, so you have a tree on both sides. I, two things, number one, I don't think we should, as we've already noted, be quite so literal. The idea of one tree in both sides doesn't make sense literally, but I don't think that's the way we're supposed to take John's images uh, uh, and this image here. Instead, the purpose is the meaning of these visions and to evoke, uh, 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 evoke a response in the reader that will take the reader back to the Old Testament. And here, I think, is an example of John beginning with, uh, uh, beginning with Ezekiel 47, now draws him back to the text that Ezekiel seems to draw upon, and that is the Garden of Eden account. So here, the backdrop for the tree of life is Genesis 2, verse 9 the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. So this is John's way, I think. I think this is a deliberate allusion of, by John back to Genesis 2.9. And moreover, I think it's his way of further demonstrating this is the restored garden. 
This is the restored, renewed Garden of Eden with the tree of life at its center. So uh, Ezekiel 47 itself it has Garden of Eden imagery. The, the, water flow, the river flowing out also goes back to chapter 2, the river that flew, flowed out of the garden. So the river clearly, uh, the trees of Ezekiel clearly recall the Garden of Eden and giving life to the creatures recalls the Garden of Eden. But now John, beginning with Ezekiel 47, also goes back to the original creation account and includes the tree of life. Now note what he does with the tree though. The tree of life has 12 crops and bears fruit for 12 months, uh, drawing on Ezekiel 47 again. But uh, John does something very interesting. The trees here now are for the healing of the nations, which we saw entered the New Jerusalem back in 21, uh, chapter 21, verses 24 and 26. Uh, but uh, so, so it, it, it uh, reflects this notion of the nations entering the New Jerusalem, now becoming the people of God. The healing is to be understood in terms of similar, I think, back in chapter 5 and chapter 7, those who now uh, the Lamb has redeemed by His blood, now the leaves give life there for the healing of the nations. Uh, they participate in eschatological salvation. But I wonder too if part of the healing is not also, these are the nations that are no longer ravaged by the rule of the beast. These are the nations that are no longer seduced by the beast and harmed and ravaged by, by the rule of the beast and the rule of Satan. Now they experience eschatological salvation. Now the leaves bring them healing. So it's important to understand that this uh, 22, 1 through 5, as I said, is, is not a new, this is not a new geographical location in the new creation. John isn't seeing something else or something different from the new Jerusalem. Uh, it's important to understand that garden and temple language are, 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 are uh, merged very closely throughout the Old Testament as well as here. Ezekiel 47 has already done it. Ezekiel 40 through 47 has already linked temple imagery now in chapter 47 with Garden of Eden imagery by portraying the temple as a place where the river flows out of the garden and the place where the tree of life and the trees that give life now exist. And so John is not, uh, John is not seeing something different. Uh, this is entirely consistent with his portrayal of the New Jerusalem as a temple where God's people serve as priests. And that is because, in my understanding, the Old Testament temple was, out of all the things it did, one of the most important things is it functioned as a sort of as a miniature Garden of Eden. If you read the description of the tabernacle, but also the temple, it's interesting that uh, the author describes it uh, in the Old Testament as uh, having engravings of palm trees and, and plants and flowers and things like that engraved upon it. It also has two cherubim in the Holy of Holies overlooking the, the ark and uh, probably reflecting the two angels that guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden uh, as a sanctuary, as a holy temple. Uh, the flowers, plants, and trees reminding us of the trees and the fruitfulness of the Garden of Eden and of the first creation. Uh, so that, and, and we've, we've already seen that, the, for example, back in Ezekiel chapter 28, Adam was portrayed as a priest in the garden wearing the breastplates, the 12 stones from the breastplate of the high priest, so that we should see Garden and temple imagery not as distinct from each other, but uh, the Garden of Eden would have originally been a temple, a sacred space where God dwell, originally do, dwelled with Adam and Eve and where Adam functioned, Adam and Eve functioned as priests who served and worshiped God in the garden temple sanctuary. Now, uh, it, it, consistent with that, John also sees the New Jerusalem uh, temple in the new creation now in terms of Garden of Eden imagery. But we'll see also very soon John's going to turn right back to temple, a priestly language in just a moment. But verse 3, 
Uh, perhaps further describing the healing of the nations in verse 3, John says, no longer will there, be, will there be any curse. And the reason there won't be any curse, the throne of God and of the Lamb is in the city, and his servants will serve him. That language of cursing, at, at, at a glance that could recall the original curse from the Garden of Eden, uh, back in chapter 3, because of human sinfulness, but instead, this is an allusion to Zechariah. And uh, uh, Zechariah ends in chapter 14, ends with a vision of end time uh, eschatological salvation. And chapter 14, verse 11, uh, it will be inhabited again, uh, I'm sorry, it will be inhabited, that is Jerusalem, never again will it be destroyed. Uh, that language of destruction is the language that occurs here in, uh, uh, in fact, the, in the Septuagint, the Greek word used of destruction in Zechariah 14.11 is very similar to the one used here by John in 22.3. And the idea behind the, the, the word in Zechariah is, is uh, what is, uh, scholars often translate a ban on destruction uh, that was pronounced on a nation. Uh, because of their sinfulness, that is, uh, evil nations were to undergo complete destruction. And now John is saying there will be no more curse. That is, there will be no more destruction of any city or any nation. Because now the healing of the nations, rather than destruction of the nations, has come. And now they inhabit the New Jerusalem and they participate in eschatological salvation. And that is because God's presence, God and the Lamb are now in the city. Their presence now guarantees that there will be no more destruction of the nations. No more ban on destruction. Instead, then verses 4 through 5 return to, I think, portraying the people of God as priests that serve him in the garden temple, which is what Adam and Eve were to do in Genesis 1 and 2. So now they're portrayed as, seeing, as serving him as priests. Uh, they also see his face. Uh, just uh, uh, th that is now the, as priests, they, they enter God's presence and they actually uh, see the presence of God, they actually see his face, but now it's not restricted to the high priest, but now all of God's people function as priest and actually see the very presence of God. His name is on their forehead. Uh, clearly this uh, recalls chapter 7 and chapter 14, where the 144,000 are sealed, and they stand with their, the, before God with their names, his name, the name of the Father on their foreheads. Uh, uh, it also contrasts with the mark of the beast. Uh, that, uh, so now you have God's people standing with the mark of God on their foreheads. It, it probably uh, in, uh, indicates intimacy and close relationship with God, but also probably reflects priestly language, and that would be the turban that Aaron wore on his head uh, uh, when he entered the temple, uh, when he entered the tabernacle. Uh, Exodus 28, for example, and verses 36 through 38. The last phrase I want to focus on in 22, uh, besides the priestly language of serving God, seeing his face in his presence, as the priest having his name on their forehead, and now uh, again in verse 5, in the no need of a physical, separate physical temple because the Lamb and God give it light. Uh, now it ends by saying, and they will reign forever and ever. First of all, this text is to be seen as the fulfillment of texts such as uh, uh, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, where in one of the hymns sung to the Lamb in the heavenly throne room scene, uh, he has uh, redeemed people from every tribe, language, and tongue to make them a kingdom of priests, and they will rule forever. And now we see that fulfilled here in chapter 22 and verse 6, God's people ruling forever. Uh, we also... Now, we also saw in, in uh, texts such as uh, 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 
chapters two and three, where the uh, uh, especially the last uh, the last promise to the overcomer that they would sit on God's throne and rule with Him. So throughout the book, we have seen an anticipation of and a promise of the churches that if they overcome, they would rule. And here we see that fulfilled as God's people now reign forever and ever. Uh, and this is also. This should also be seen, I think, as the final fulfillment of Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, which was alluded to in chapter 1, 5, and 6. Christ has now redeemed people from every tribe and language to become a kingdom of priests. Now here we see them functioning as kings and priests ruling over all things. And uh, chapter 5 as well that we looked at, 5 verse 10, uh, that now... Christ has redeemed people from all tribes and language to become a kingdom of priests, and they rule forever. In other words, in verse, in verse 4 and the first part of verse 5, we see the fulfillment of Ezekiel, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus 19.6, that is that they will be priests, which again Revelation 1 and Revelation 5 picks up. They will be a kingdom of priests. 4 and 5, we see them functioning as priests. They serve God. They see His face in His presence. Uh, uh, they, they wear the, the, the uh, priest headband or turban with the God names, God's name on their forehead, and, uh, but not in a physical temple because God and the Lamb are its light. That's the priestly part. Now, and they will reign forever and ever. This fulfills the other part, that they will be a kingdom. So, although, I, although you don't find the word kingdom of priests here, and although you do not see a direct allusion to Exodus 19.6, I think John is, is uh, thinking in terms of Exodus 19.6. Here we see God's people not called a kingdom of priests. Here we see them functioning as a kingdom of priests in 22 and uh, 1 through 5. Now, <clears throat> The other thing to say about this text, uh, the other thing to mention about this text is I think we should read it in light of Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28, where in the first creation, uh, not only was Adam, and we've seen this in apocalyptic texts, not only was Adam to function as a priest, so in one sense, the priestly activity of the people here in the Garden of Eden also reflects Adam's priestly activity in Genesis 1 and 2. And uh, we, we've, we suggested that in apocalyptic text and Ezekiel 28, Adam is portrayed as a priest in the Garden of Eden. So the priestly activity here is the ultimate fulfillment of Adam's, uh, God's intention for Adam and Eve to function as priests in the Garden. But also, in light of, Je even more specifically and explicitly, in light of Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1 and 26 through 28, a text that uh, 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 most of us uh, recall, but I'll, actually I'll start with verse, start with, uh, verse 26 and 20, uh, read through 27. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll, I'll read 28 as well, I think. So 26 through 28. God creates Adam and Eve, and it says, so God created, uh, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, and over all of the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over every living creature. So they're to fill the earth and rule over the earth and subdue the earth as God's image bearers. I think here we find the final fulfillment of what God intended for Adam. That is to rule over creation. Now you find God's people fulfilling the mandate given to Adam of ruling over creation, now they rule over the new creation in fulfillment of Genesis 1, 26 through 28. So the vision ends with, uh, 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 John's vision ends with God's people living on a new creation, Garden of Eden, 
with God and the Lamb dwelling in their midst, with God's temple presence, suffusing the entire creation, fulfilling the intention of the original New Jerusalem and temple, so that now, now the goal of God's redemptive historical plan has finally been reached. Uh, uh, notice, too, what one could summarize this by noting all the, the new features that uh, are fulfillment of Old Testament texts. We find the new creation. We're introduced to a new Jerusalem. The new covenant gets fulfilled. We find the new people of God, a new temple, and, and uh, salvation in terms of a new exodus. So to put this vision kind of in its context, what is the overall function of this vision? First of all, clearly this is meant to contrast with the prostitute Babylon. Back in chapter 18, verse 4, God's people were called to leave, come out of her, leave Babylon, the prostitute Babylon. And we said that's not so much physically, which would be impossible, but instead it means to separate oneself from their values. Uh, to refuse to participate in the idolatrous, godless practices of Rome. The idea is not physical separation. Uh, uh, we'll see that. I, I think John assumes that his people are going to remain. And, and in fact, in chapters 2 and 3, he calls on them to be a faithful witness. They can't do that if they remove themselves physically. So it's, it's more separating themselves from the ideology of Rome, from their godless, idolatrous practices, uh, from worshiping the emperor and worshiping foreign gods and worshiping the beast. But if they are to leave the prostitute Babylon, which is Rome, they must have somewhere to go. And that now takes place in 21 and 22 in the New Jerusalem. If they leave one city, they need another city to go to. And now 21 and 22 presents the alternative uh, that God's people now can enter. Second, the New Jerusalem vision also functions to engender faithfulness in God's people. So it's not primarily meant to just predict a future event and to show us exactly what the new creation is going to look like and what we're going to be doing and what everything is, you know, what's going to be there and who's going to be there. Uh, it's not meant to answer those kinds of questions. It provides the promise and reward for those who maintain their faithful witness. It's meant to motivate God, the, the, peop, the churches in chapters 2 and 3 to holiness and purity in the present. And so it's the promise and reward for those who overcome in chapters 2 and 3. And we, we've already suggested that all the promises to the overcomer in, two, two and, in the messages in 2 and 3, most of them have links to chapter 21 and 22. And then finally, in that God's people are already a kingdom of priests, the people of God should already be modeling and witnessing to the life of the new creation in the present. So I think what John is doing is not only presenting this as a future hope, which it is, the future reward and motivation, but because where, where his people will function as kings, kings and priests in 22, 1 through 5, but chapter 1 and chapter 5, because they are already God's kings and priests, they should be witnessing to and testifying already to the life of the new creation. Now, having come to the very end of John's vision, chapter 22, 6 through 21, ends with, I think, a series of, of, of uh, sayings that it, it, it's, it's very difficult to tell at times who is saying what. Uh, there are a couple statements that I think are clearly Jesus Christ. There are others that may be an angel. There are others that may be John himself speaking. But it's hard to sort out uh, the voices in 22, 6, and following. But I think what's going on overall, before I look at just a couple of, of details, what I think is go going on overall is that uh, uh, this is now a further series of exhortations as to how the readers are to respond to the book. And basically what it is, it's, it's a further call to holiness and obedience and faithful witness on the part of the church. So we said 22.5 sort of ends the vision proper, but it, it's now as if the reader is 
kind of brought back to earth, we might say, to now live out the reality of the book of Revelation. And so 22, 6 to the end could sort of be seen in analogy or, or almost as a bookend with chapter 1, 1 through 3 that tells us about the nature of the book and how we're supposed to respond. Now at the other end of the book, we have more. Having seen the whole vision, now it's expanded to tell us in more detail how we are to respond, how we are to live out the reality of Revelation 4, uh, uh, Revelation 4 through 22. Uh, one author said, and I think he's right, Revelation is not a script of the end times. It's a script of the church. It, it's a script for how we are to live out life now in the present. And 22, 6 and to the end of the chapter would certainly affirm that. For example, uh, uh, just to highlight a couple features of this, uh, John says in, in a scene resembling chapter 19 at the end of the, uh, new, uh, the, the uh, Babylon prostitute image uh, vision where John is tempted to bow down and worship the angel, once more in verses 9 and 10, uh, uh, 9 and 10 uh, John is 8 and 9 actually, John is tempted to bow down to ver worship an angel and the angel says, do not do it, I'm only a servant, instead worship God. Now, what is important here, I think, is not only, as we said earlier, as part, interestingly, in the context of a monotheistic vision where only God is to be worshipped, Jesus Christ also is an object of worship, but perhaps this is a reminder of the correct response of the vision, that John is not to be infatuated with the angel and the vision that he saw, but instead it should lead him to worship God. And so right at the beginning, this is a call for the response to this vision is, should be nothing less than worshiping God himself. Uh, I think as John is calling his church, how John is calling his churches to respond. Uh, the other feature in, in uh, verse 11 this is sort of interesting. Verse 11, John is told, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. And sealing up is an image for uh, not divulging its content, not revealing it, because it's for a future time. And this, this language comes out of Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, where Daniel is told to seal up the vision. Now John is told not to. Why? Because it is directly relevant for his readers. So they cannot afford... Uh, they cannot afford to simply see this as something for the future. Instead, this is a message relevant to the readers. That John is not to seal it up because the time is near. The fulfillment is already at hand. Uh, 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 Revelation is, is addressing their situation. But furthermore, John has this interesting statement in verse 11, Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. But let him who is right continue to do right, and let him who is holy continue to be holy, supporting the response of holiness. In other words, the, the vision of Revelation should engender righteousness and holiness. But this language is kind of interesting in verse 11. What is John calling for? Uh, John has portrayed the church as a faithful witness, or, or it portrays the church as uh, and requiring of it to be a faithful witness even in the face of opposition. But then here he seems to refute that by saying, anyone who is, does wrong, let them to continue to do wrong. It's almost as if John has now resigned himself to fate, that uh, people who do wrong are just going to do wrong, and people who do right will continue to do, do that, and uh, you know, the judgment will sort that out at the end. But instead, I wonder if the way to take this is to see it more as a reflection of the response of the readers, some, or, or response of the world to not only this book, but to the witness of the church. Some will harden themselves and refuse to repent. Others, though, will respond. God's people will respond with faithfulness. The true people of God will respond in faithfulness and obedience and holiness, whereas uh, uh, those, uh, uh, for others, revelation will bring about a response of hardening themselves. Uh, this may be similar to Jesus' own teaching with his parables. 
uh, as Jesus says a couple of times, the parables on one hand, functioned to harden those who rebelled and those who refused to re obey. It functioned to harden them. Whereas those who had ears to hear, a phrase that John uses several times, the one who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Those who have ears to hear God's word will respond in holiness and obedience. Those who are dull of hearing, those who are rebellious, it will function to harden them and they will continue in their disobedience. A couple of, of other texts, uh, first of all, verse 17 is difficult as well, as far as sorting out who is doing what. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Usually this has been seen as sort of an evangelistic call. Uh, that is, the coming would be the coming of, of the non-saved and, and uh, the, the, those who come to take the free gift of water would be the unsaved, the unbelievers, who now uh, respond to the message of the gospel and uh, find salvation. However, I think the first two comes, the spirit and the bride say come, and let him who hears says come, is should be understood as more of a request or a prayer for Jesus himself to come. Notice verse 7 that begins this, Behold, I am coming soon. Then blessed who keeps the words of the book of his prophecy. Again, blessed is the one who keeps the words, so showing us once again the response to this book is one of obedience and holiness. So notice every book we've looked at so far has engendered worship, back in verse uh, 8 and 9, and now faithfulness and righteousness. Uh, and now skipping ahead then in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. That is, in response to Jesus' words in verse 7, behold, I am coming, now the bride and the one who hears, probably the one who has ears, let him hear, now respond by saying, come, Lord Jesus which is how the book ends. Amen, come Lord Jesus. So I see the word come here, not as a call for unbelievers to come, but as a call or a prayer or a request for Jesus Christ to come, just as he promised, I am coming soon. And then whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Probably, again, not so much a call to respond in faith of the gospel, an evangelistic call, but should be understood in light of chapter 21 and verse uh, 6. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. This is the promise, an eschatological promise for the people of God. So the one who wishes to come would be the people of God invited to come and participate in final salvation. The final, the final text that I want to draw attention to is verses 18 and 19, which I want to demonstrate to you is also to be understood as an, uh, as an exhortation, an ethical response on the part of the readers. That is, it's, it's meant to, uh, verses 18 and 19 is a call to obedience and faithfulness. Let me read this section, uh, verses 18 to 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, Revelation 21 and 22, which are described in this book. And then the plagues in verse 18 would be the trumpets, bowls, seals, and perhaps the end time judgment. Now, how are we to understand this text, this language of anyone who adds and subtracts will be guilty of the plagues, uh, or, or anyone who adds or subtracts will not participate in the eschatological salvation in the inheritance or reward of, of Revelation 21 and 22. Usually, this, this ver these two verses are usually taken in two different ways. Number one, they are a warning to later scribes and later 
readers and interpreters of Revelation not to tamper with it by adding words or deleting words, by writing further paragraphs or sections or deleting certain parts that one does not like. Uh, many take it that way. A second way to take it is to see this as a warning against unbelievers, especially cults and other religions that would add books to the Bible. Some, some see it significant that this occurs at the very end of the Bible and they would see it as encompassing the whole canon. So this is a warning for other cults and religions and teachings that would try to add their own writings and their own books, uh, their own sayings to the Bible or taking books out of the Bible, uh, re removing certain books or uh, something like that. Uh, so this, this is often seen as a, a sort of a bibliological sp uh, uh, statement about the authority of Scripture and, and not tampering with it, not deleting from it, not adding anything, that it is the authoritative Word of God and it is sufficient as it stands. And I certainly would not quibble and argue with that. I would agree with that, but I'm not sure that's what these verses are doing in this context. First of all, as we've noted already, starting of verse 7, uh, uh, everything is in the context of exhortation. Uh, uh, Jesus says, I'm coming soon in verse 7. Blessed are the ones who keep the words of this prophecy. And then John, uh, sort of embodying the response he wants from his readers, is told by the angel, don't worship me, worship God which should be the proper response to the book. Response to the book. The, uh, uh, verses 10 and 11, uh, this is a prophecy for the present. Don't seal it up. It's for the people of God now. And, and the one who is righteous continues to do righteous. The one who is holy continues to be holy. Uh, verses 14 and following, blessed is the one who is pure. They will receive, they will receive the, the tree of life. So everything is, this is exhortation. Now, verses 18 through 19, and 19, I think, continue the exhortation of motivating God's people to faithfulness and holiness and obedience. Now, why do I say that? First of all, uh, notice that these verses are an allusion to, once more, as we've seen happen so often through Revelation, an allusion back to the Old Testament. You find this same language back in Deuteronomy in relationship to the Old Testament law. Uh, so, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 4, as uh, the nation of Israel is addressed, they are being re reminded not to forsake the law, not to neglect it. And uh, the author says, uh, this is chapter two, 4 and verse 2. I'll read verse 1. Hear now, O Israel. The degree, decrees and laws that I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land the Lord God has given and your fathers have, have given you. Which is interesting. One of the things they, the, in Revelation chapter 22 verse 19 is if they, take, if they add or take away, they will not receive the tree of life and the holy city. That is the new creation, uh, the, their inheritance, the land. But now verse 2, he says, Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your, that the Lord your God has given you. And uh, uh, chapter Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32, uh, we find something similar. In 12 verse 32, towards the very end, uh, the author says, I'll read verse 31, you must, not worship, uh, you must not worship the Lord your God in that way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire and sacrifice to their gods. See that you do all I command, do not add to it or take away. Interestingly, too, that one is in the context of not worshiping idols and other gods as the nations do. So, the first thing to note is John has drawn on a, a, a on language that comes out of the book of Deuteronomy, and in both of those contexts, the statements to do not add or take away were in the context of keeping the law, doing everything that it says. So, even back in Deuteronomy, the idea of taking away and adding was not just 
adding more words or taking away. It had to do with making sure you obey it and keep it. Second is, I want you to note who this is addressed to. Verses 18 and 19 are addressed to, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Who is the person who hears the words of the prophecy of this book? Go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3. It is the church. Chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy of this book and who keep it. So the one who hears the words of the prophecy would be those in the churches, the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, or our churches today. In other words, this is addressing the churches or believers. And here they are warned that when they hear the words of the prophecy of this book, do not neglect it, but instead keep it. So this is not addressed to later scribes uh, who would tamper with the book. This is not addressed to non-believers and what they might do with the book. This is not addressed to cults and false religions. This is addressed to the church. Uh, furthermore, what that means is, I think we should see this text as the bookend along with chapter 1, verse 3. 1, verse 3 pronounces a blessing on the one who hears the word of God and obeys it. Now we find a cursing for the one who hears the word of God and refuses to keep it. In other words, what does it mean to add and take away? I think this is metaphorical for disobeying the word of God and refusing to keep it, especially by compromising with the idolatrous pagan world. The same thing that Israel was warned against back in, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now, John is warning his churches in chapters 2 and 3 that when they hear the book read, the only resp proper response is one of worship, one of obedience, one of righteousness, one of holiness, uh, one of, in light of the soon expectation of the return of Jesus Christ, to respond in faithfulness and obedience. To refuse to respond in obedience. To substitute and add idols. To take away from God's word by neglecting it and refusing to obey it. That's what it means to add and subtract from the word of God. So this is not a call for uh, uh, other cults and religions not to add words. It's not a call for, the, the idea here is not whether you write new sentences or paragraphs, which I would agree you shouldn't. This is an ethical call. This is a call for obedience and faithfulness to, the, to, to refuse to participate in the pagan idolatrous empire of, of Rome for the first readers. The last thing I want to mention about the book of Revelation itself, and then I, I want to end with just a handful of comments as to how we read it. Uh, notice the language that you find several times here. Starting in verse 7, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon. And then verse 20, Yes, I am coming soon. Probably all words spoken by Jesus himself. How do we understand that soonness? Well, some, would say, uh, some have translated it, I am coming quickly, and the idea would be more the speed with which he comes, not that it's going to happen very soon, uh, for example, in the lifetime of the readers. Some have suggested that John was wrong, that Jesus did not come back soon. Uh, I think, though, the way to look at this is that we should interpret this from the standpoint of this reflects the, simply the, the expectation of the soon return of Christ by the church. All throughout the centuries, the church has always expected that Christ could come back at any time. Uh, though we have no idea when that's going to be, uh, the soon return of Christ, that he could come back at any time, uh, which was true. In fact, the fact that he had already come the first time to inaugurate his salvation and kingdom uh, meant that... Uh, he could come back at any time to wrap that up and bring that to its consummation. So I think the soon here should be understood with its full force. Christ is coming soon, but the idea is the church has always expected the soon return of Christ, uh, the, uh, although we simply don't know when that is going to occur. 
and that isn't reflected in here uh, in these sayings. But again, the soonness of the return of Christ is what adds urgency to the ethical appeal of this last section. To worship God alone, to faithfulness, to holiness, to righteousness, to making sure that we keep and obey the words of the book of Revelation by refusing to compromise with the pagan idolatrous world. And so ends the book of Revelation, and uh, fittingly it ends with, Amen, come Lord Jesus. And I think the appropriate response at the end of the day to Revelation would be everyone to chime in and say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. And as we wait for that, we live lives of holiness and purity and righteousness, and we refuse to be influenced by, we refuse to participate in the idolatrous, godless, oppressive, evil practices and system and values that characterize not only the Roman Empire, but characterize uh, cultures and nations in, wor in our world today. Now, I want to end by uh, just raising the question just briefly in the next few minutes is, how should we read the book of Revelation? At the very beginning of, of this uh, a series of lectures on Revelation, we said that a very popular way of interpreting Revelation is to see it as something to be read in light of our modern days. So, <clears throat> that we draw connections <clears throat> between the visions and language of Revelation and modern day, now 21st century, modern day events and persons and nations and people and, and technologies, uh, so that uh, as, as some as many as, as many have uh, characterized it in the past, it's like reading uh, uh, with the book of Revelation, the Bible open to Revelation in one hand and reading the morning newspaper on the at another hand. And the idea is we, we draw immediate connections and we see the uh, Revel John is actually predicting what's going on in, our own, on in our own day. We have the key to reading it. And usually what that means then is we, st we try to plot our existence uh, and see how close we are to the end. And sometimes that even results in blatant predictions of when Christ is going to come back that uh, 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 all have one thing in common. They've all failed. If this is not the proper way to read Revelation, how should we read it? Let me suggest five things. First of all, it's just kind of a, a, a little bit different from the others, but first of all, Revelation, Revelation does suggest that history is moving towards a goal and that God is the one who will bring it to its consummation. So it won't come through human effort. Revelation is not a vision for uh, uh, what our present culture and our society can become, although it could do that, but that's not the primary intent of it. Revelation is not just a vision, especially the latter chapters in the New Jerusalem. It's not just a vision for, uh, to give us hope for our present society and our present day. No, it gives us hope for the future. It reminds us that God, that history is moving somewhere. God is going to bring history to a close. He himself will intervene and he will set the world right. Through his judgment and salvation, uh, God is going to bring history to its close. So Revelation, we cannot let go of the telic sense of Revelation, that it has a goal, that, it, that, that uh, our world is moving somewhere, and God is the one, God is the Alpha and the Omega, the one standing at the beginning of that process, and the one who stands at the end, who will bring it to its goal. Our hope is the future, coming of Jesus Christ to consummate God's plan for history through judgment and salvation and to set this world right. That is the hope of God's people. But second, the next four uh, that I want to emphasize, I think also come out clearly out of the book of Revelation. And that is first, or number two, Revelation is a call to worship and allegiance. That is Revelation, we should read it as a call to worship and allegiance. Chapter 4 and 5 begin the book at the very beginning of John's visions with an image of, in chapter 4 and 5, that reminds us that only God and the Lamb are worthy of worship. Any, to worship anything else, any other person, any other material possession, 
any other culture, any other nation, to any other government, to worship anything else, to give our allegiance to anything else, is idolatry. Revelation is a call for us to discern the dangers of idolatry in our own world, in our own lives, and to give exclusive allegiance to God and the Lamb. Revelation is a call for us in a world that resists God, in a world that refuses to acknowledge His sovereignty. Revelation is a call for God's people to join in heaven and worship and acknowledge the sovereignty of the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who is and was and who is to come. So uh, uh, we should read Revelation as a call to worship and allegiance to God and the Lamb, and to, to, to recognize that any, to worship, to give that worship and allegiance to anything else is nothing less than idolatry. Second, or, uh, uh, number three, revelate, we should also read Revelation as a call to witness and mission. Note how many times the, 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 the church is described or people in, throughout the book are described as those who maintain their faithful witness and the word of the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is, the church, Revelation is a call for the church to engage in witness. We are to witness the life of the new creation. We are to witness the reality of God and his salvation he has provided through Jesus Christ. Through our worship, we are to witness the reality of, of who God is and what he has done for his people uh, uh, through the person of Jesus Christ. The, the fact that we are already kingdom of priests, the fact that Jesus Christ, through his death, has already created his church as a kingdom of priests, means that we are to witness the reality of an alternative world. A new creation characterized by justice and faithfulness and love and righteousness, a, a, a place where perfect worship uh, uh, takes place, a place where perfect activity and meaningful life emerges only in the new creation, but that should now be represented, that should now be witnessed to by the kingdom of priests that God has already created through his son, Jesus Christ. The reality of the new creation should already be evident in our lives. Uh, we should be testifying to and witnessing to the life of the new creation. So in that sense, revelation is a call for mission and witness on the part of God's people, the church. Fourth, we should read Revelation as a call to discernment and resist. That is, because of the deceptive nature of sin, because of the deceptive nature of Satan and, and his attempts to thwart God's purposes and his people and to, be, to lead us astray, it requires discernment. It requires insight. And Revelation provides us that insight. We need insight to determine where Babylon is present in our own day and age. We need insight and, to, uh, and uh, a discernment to determine where there is injustice, where there is idolatry, where there is godlessness, where there is violence and harm. We need insight and discernment to see where that is present in our own lives, in our own cultures, our own nations, our own countries, our own governments. We need insight and then we need to resist that and stand up against that, not through violence, but through faithful witness to the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and faithful witness to the reality of the new creation. As in true apocalyptic fashion, we've seen revelation exposes godlessness. It, it exposes and unveils idolatry and oppressive nations and empires, but it also provides an, an alternative perspective. And uh, we need insight into and discernment and the ability to resist through our faithful witness. Uh, wherever Babylon is. One of my colleagues once said, Babylon is humanity's attempt to set up paradise while leaving God completely out of the picture. And it requires discernment and insight to determine where that is in our own life and our own day and age, uh, and, and also to stand up and resist that. 
But it also calls that we root that out in our own lives. See, we start with ourselves and realize where we, in a sense, have climbed into bed with Babylon uh, unwittingly. Fifth and finally, we should read Revelation as a call for obedience and discipleship. God's people are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And we just looked at the very last verses, six through the uh, chapter six, through, uh, chapter twenty-two, verses six to the end of the book, is a call to holiness and faithfulness on the part of God's people. God's people are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Revelation is a call for unqualified obedience and discipleship to the person of Jesus Christ, no matter what the consequences it brings. So if Revelation does not evoke at least those five responses in us when we read it, we probably have not heeded the call to have ears to hear the book of Revelation. This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in his course on the book of Revelation. This is the final session, session number 30, Revelation chapter 22, New Jerusalem, and how to read the book of Revelation.